Hello, UXDX. I'm Mansi Kambar, and I'm super excited to speak at our first UXDX conference today. I'm going to take you through my journey of how we're going to build products and humanize these digital experiences, which this pandemic has taught us is even more so important. So fasten your seatbelts and get ready for this ride. As a product leader, I've been fortunate to work at across various domains in the past 15 years. So I started with printing at Xerox, uh, the Google Calendar that you many of you may be using at Google, uh, in the financial industry with JP Morgan, as well as Fannie Mae, and now working for one of the biggest retailers, which is Walmart. In this journey uh, and working through various domains, what it's taught me the most is to offer and appreciate the importance of learning the skill art and valuing the importance of people, culture, and ways of working. And these then become the foundations to make this ride a little less bumpy and a lot more fun. So as we get started, uh, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a principal product manager at Walmart. And what I love doing each day is creating and building products that touch, that touch millions of lives of people and associates. And as we build, we build for scale. And what, ha what it has taught me as being a fearless leader, a woman and a mother. And there's no joy or in a ride without the music and the love for cooking. So that's my little go-to places, um, you know, when things get too rough. Uh, in this journey, I often get asked the question, what is product and what is it that you do every day, right? Is the most sought after field that it feels like these days and can you tell us what does it take to be a product leader? And you'll often find in analogies where um, people would say you're the captain of a ship, you're an orchestra director, or uh, I've even heard one that says it's like a game of cards, like you need all the strategy to make sure that you can get it right. What has really worked for me as an analogy has been uh, product to me is what I do every day. So think about putting a menu together for a meal at the table for the day, the week, uh, when friends come together, or even financial planning that you do every day in your lives. And if you think about that process, what you're thinking through is, what do I have in my pantry today? Uh, do I have something or am I you know, missing something on my list? Uh, are my little audiences gonna be happy with what I put together? Uh, am I going to have to influence that idea or am I going to have to put my foot down and drive a decision? And I'm sure all of these sound way too familiar. These are nothing but uh, setting our note stars, putting our goals together, thinking about our problem statements, managing our stakeholders, being customer centric, our little kids in the house, uh, influencing and driving that execution. So whether it's cooking that meal, managing your finances, or building these products, these are the life skills that help you be a better product leader. And what I've found is that taking these skills into work helps me be a product leader, but taking the learnings from work helps me navigate my own life better, right? So that's where that whole journey kind of comes together. Um, so how did we get here through this journey? And I'm sure um, all of you have either been through are in or can resonate with one of these phases as you've gone through them, right? So you're either in one of the phase looking to move and evolve into the next evolution stage, or uh, you've experienced them and you know, you've gone through those phases together. So when we started this journey, if you can you know, jog your memory back, uh, think about the days where everything was requirements and uh, business or subject matter experts told us what they wanted, they told us exactly what the solution they were seeking. And we took those requirements and we translated them and then we provided them to our software development teams so that they could then build the solutions to meet those needs. From that phase of requirements, we then moved into more product centric thinking. So we started putting the products in front of us and started putting those as the forefront of our development. Very quickly, we learned that we need to be customer centric, right? So we got to think about customers, not just about the product, but what needs are we meeting for those customers? And then now you see a lot of data being collected with this journey process 
that then becomes a data-driven product development. So as we go through that phase and we think about you know, what those phases are, uh, what we want to do is how do we build these products to serve the needs of what people want and desire. So what this visual is going to tell you is, and put that story together in perspective, is I'm sure you all can resonate with the tire swing cartoon, right? And you've seen um, something being asked for and not quite getting what you asked for, right? And then since then, you became a product centric. And you're probably wondering, what's the ketchup bottle doing in the middle of all of that? And I think that's an analogy that, that I love using, right? So think about the ketchup bottle with a cap on the top and you've got the ketchup in it and it serves your need, right? You wanna get the ketchup to our users and you made that happen. But when you think about the struggle of the user where they're trying to get that last bit of ketchup at the bottom of the bottle, outside the bottle, and you change your perspective. So being from product centric to change about the customer, you just flip that bottle over and voila, you've solved that problem, right? So that kind of tells you the shift in the mindset that we have to make as we think about the products that we build. And very quickly, as we get, went through this journey, uh, what we've also done is we've, we've taken our ideas, we ideate on them, we prototype them, we take our customers' insights, and then we build those improvements through that data into the next development that we wanna see in our products. So that's where data-driven pr product development comes into the. So think about it as idea creation, concept creation, forming your strategy, uh, developing that product, testing it, uh, launching it, getting in, into the hands of millions of users, and then going back and rinsing and repeating that process. So that's what the, the data devel development process is. So let me use um, retail as an example, right? As you think about, we've all been uh, a retail shopper in some form or other. Uh, we see ourselves go in as customers to the store and look and feel and see the products that we're planning to purchase. So if you think about that retail journey, uh, way back, you know, customers didn't trust what online was or didn't even think about that concept. You always wanted to go into a store. You wanted to touch and feel your products. You wanted to know what you want to buy and then walk away with that transaction. Then very quickly uh, came in a need where we wanted to leverage the online shopping. And we wanted to do that so that we could look at competitive pricing and look at you know, what the offerings are across the different stores and then go in and complete that shopping still in the stores because it was you know, providing us education, inspiring us when you were trying to make a meal, pick a product and find other products that you're looking for. And we still saw our customers wanting to create that connection. But I think with this pandemic more so, we've realized that we got to enable and unlock the online shopping to the extent that it feels like a human interaction, right? So how do we take that leap and how are we taking that leap from being, you know, um, not wanting to go online at all to now wanting to shop online for a large portion of the journey that we take? So how do we create that foreign, uh, you know, not so understood experience? as the most go-to experience that we're seeking to happen. So as you think about these and you start to build these building blocks to come to execution, what I've found is that it requires those foundations to be in place, right? And so in order to create that shop and browse, how do you create the recommendations? How do you personalize? How do you think about a customer that walks in and gets uh, inspired uh, by what they're shopping in the stores and recreating those experiences online. How do we make that happen in a whole digital format for our customers is what we're trying to focus on. And in order to do that, the foundations that we wanna build on is how do we think about our teams? How do we think about our roles? How do we think about collaboration? And how do we think about empowerment? So it's not just the tools, it's not just the tech, it's not just the thinking, but how do we bring the ways of working into our foundation so that we can truly build bigger, better products? And how do we take our people as through this journey that was foreign, but design systems that are usable and puts that thought process into being? 
So when you think about that, what we find is uh, people culture, as well as the ways of working being that strong foundation. So in order to succeed, we need to respect each of these roles played. We want these roles to collaborate together. We want to empower our people playing these roles so that they can make and drive those decisions and ideas. So with this four in a box concept, the ability to monitor and track our analytics gets us to build those better products. So when you think about each of those roles, and I'm gonna kind of spin through this little circle that you see, where we talk through um, you know, our business leaders. Our business leaders are providing us um, the direction that know the domain, they understand the history, and they know the gotchas of the business, right? So they're telling us what the problems are, what they've seen historically, that can help us understand and better understand that problem on hand. Then we have our product leaders that are putting the customer-centric, product-centric uh, you know, hats on, and then going in to problem solve and plan for that launch. Then comes in our little design group that actually then puts the utilization of design principles. It's thinking, it's discovery, research, prototyping, collecting all that usability feedback, and then putting that product into life, right? So how do we bring those to life together? And last but not the least, our engineering or our technology teams, right? So they're now architecting, designing, and building these products that not only serve the need today, but also are building and scaling to hold strong for tomorrow. So that's what has evolved and then become our data-driven product development approach that our customers, people, um, you know, enjoy and can recreate those shopping experiences that humanizes it for them. So as we think through this journey, what I wanna think through and get your minds to is the tools and the techniques that are being used, right? So think about them as how are you thinking about discovery, the concept design and review? How are we putting those in the hands of the people that can actually feel and touch our products use them and give us feedback. How do we collect that feedback on an ongoing basis, optimize it, and then put them back into our product strategy, right? And I'm sure as you think through and you're hearing all these terms and the processes, I'm hoping that you can either resonate with them, you have experienced them, or you're just itching to put these principles into your next big project or product development. So as you think about those foundations and roles, and you think about business, product, design, engineering, and the culture and ways of working, let's see how can we relate that to a retail shopping journey and how that's evolving, right? So that's some of the, the work that I've been doing in the most recent projects that I worked through. And I'll share a few experiences or that process and how that gets implemented into the work that we do. So think about um, a customer trying to search for a product. And if you think about you know, where we started, we started with keyword searches. So let's say you were trying to buy a cocktail dress for an occasion. So you're getting ready for a party. You want your best cocktail dress and you want to look best tonight. And as you're thinking about that, you're going to try to put search terms as, you know, I'm looking for a blue cocktail dress or a red cocktail dress. Um, am I going to look for something that's off-shouldered? Am I going to look for a certain contemporary look? And so we use these keywords and we then surface the products that our customers are looking for. And then we go in and we evolve through that process and we start recommending, right? So we start recommending to our customers, you know, you may be looking for um, an evening outfit or a day outfit. Is there a time factor and when you're gonna utilize that product? Are you thinking about your customization, their branding, their their personalized needs. So are we thinking about their size? Are we thinking about what brands do they shop with? So that's where the evolution came in and we started understanding our customer, the customer 360. And then we start to bring more intelligence into the shopping experience. So if you think about the, you know, when I previously talked about walking into the store where it was educational and inspirational, you walked in and you saw an aisle full of, you know, pasta, but then it told you, oh, I need the sauce too. And oh, by the way, do I have all the spices and the seasonings to go with it? Similarly, we want to do that online. And how do the, we make that happen? We not only recommend another dress in the category that you've selected, 
But we then take it further and we say, hey, you probably need some sandals and some shoes. You probably need a purse. You need some accessories to go with it, it to make you, you know, look better for that night and get you that perfect look. And so how do we start intelligently offering our customers those experiences that they would have seen in the store or replicate those experiences no matter where their journey starts? So that's the, you know, that, that takes you through that evolution on how do you now not just shop for that dress that you were looking for that evening? Uh, you've bought all the slew of accessories and, you know, things to go with it so that you can add them in your basket, in your cart, and kind of walk away uh, with that perfect look for that night. So that's taking it even further, humanizing the shopping experience. And then where, where are we leading to now, you know, beyond this, right? So now we start thinking about, do we have shopping assistance? So when you walk into the store, you're meeting other humans, you're meeting your associates, and they're guiding you as to what you're gonna need and getting that feedback from them. So now what we have are shopping assistants that interact with you, ask you questions that will allow you to then hone in into that perfect buy. Also using 3D models and putting that dress on you so that you know how you may look. And, and that's where we start to bring that human element into that shopping experience. So in order to create these customer-driven digital experiences, um, you know, what it takes us as tools to make that happen is what brings us to what machine learning and AI truly is. So that's our next leap into how are we using these tools to enable and unlock these experiences for our customers. So when you think about the machine learning, AI, data science, you're hearing all these terms in the industry, and you're probably thinking, how am I gonna put these to use? Am I forced to use them because they're the next best thing to do? Or am I truly looking to solve the problems at hand? And so when we put these tools to use, what we really wanna do is take a step back, understand and come back to our core principles. Are we respecting the roles we play? Are we playing, collaborating, and empowering each other to play our roles better? And are we solving the problems at hand? And when you find those foundations are in place, um, that's when we use these tools to really make that, that launch into a better experience as we digitize you know, our presence online. So when you, when you start looking at machine learning, if you, if you think about you know, the journey that machine learning has taken, I'm sure we all are or have experienced rules-based systems. So if you think about it, you know, if you had X, um, you know, then you did Y, else you did Z. Uh, I'm sure we've used that, you know, if then else in all forms and matter. And when you think about those rules-based systems, in many cases, they still work, right? They still do. It's not about leaving a style behind and then moving forward. It's about taking the best of the tools that we've learned and putting them to use. So for instance, if you think about a fixed set of rules with fixed set of outputs that you're trying to drive, um, there are advantages of doing that. If they're easy to debug, there's no training required, and they have high precision. But the flip side of that is it has a moderate coverage, right? So you've got to think through all the different rule sets that you need to have in place as you're making that determination. Uh, you also need to know and have to your resources, a lot of subject matter experts that know that domain, understand the domain, and know exactly how to define those rules. But then as we think about the tool explosion that we've seen in the industry um, that supports our product development, the next big explosion that came through was big data. So now we had all of these rules. We started collecting lots of customer data, and we have lots of data all around us. And what do we do next? We got to analyze all of that and put that to use. So that's where the big data explosion came in. And one of the things that it required us to do was to make sure that you know, we were extremely reliant on um, manual analysis, right? So we needed to make sure we had all this data, we drove some insights out of it, and then we had to analyze it so that we could actually you know, derive some type of results out of them. And then the next logical progression, because that's not as sustainable, was the progression into machine learning and data engineering. So what it does for us is we start to put models and predict behaviors together using the large amounts of data that we have. 
So as you can see, you're not leaving a tool behind, but you're taking the rules and building on the data and taking the data and automating its behavior and predictions using advanced learnings and tools to then achieve the outcome that is desired. So a great example to kind of show how this comes together is think about the automated voice response systems, right? And I think we all love them, don't we? Because when you want to talk to somebody on the other end that tells you punch one, punch five, punch seven, um, and pun intended there. And so when you think about the automated voice response system, uh, the rules-based system asked us to press one for payment, two for billing, X, Y, Z, right? So that was cumbersome, painful, we all wish that we never had to talk to that machine because it, it never understood what we really wanted. So the next progression then came in and said, you know, how do we make that a little more human-like? How do we make that a little more intelligent? And so the next wave of improvement through that came in was, you know, there was someone speaking to us on the other end, which was still automated, but had a dialogue with us, understood what we were asking for, and then navigated us through that help journey. But it still had its hiccups. Um, it didn't get our accent. It possibly didn't have options that we had thought about. Um, you were looking for something, but you didn't quite get the help. Or it took you way long to get the help if, you know, that you wanted instantly at the first step. So where are we now? In this process, we're now in a human-like conversation. So think about the Google Assistant that you use uh, that converses with you as if there was a human in front of you, understands your natural language, processes it, and then communicates information back to you so that it can then navigate you through that journey. So if you think about you know, bringing all of these concepts together, you have the foundations of people, you have the foundations of collaboration and empowerment, you build on the product journey that you take about putting your customer at the center of it, and then you think about the tools within it that actually enable taking you that journey and making that ride a little less bumpy. So as you think about the machine learning uh, and, the, and the intelligence behind that, um, you then go into, you know, how is that unique in the retail world, right? So we, we, throw, um, we throw all these tools at our problems and then how do we solve for the problems at hand in our retail world? So as we talked about um, you know, the shopping experience, right? So when you think about, we were looking for um, a dress and we wanted to go to the cocktail party and we put our search terms in and we put, you know, all the recommendations that we got, we personalized it. And then it gave us recommendations for other accessories, et cetera. And how do we take it even further? So now we're on Instagram, we're on social media, we're finding pictures of the dress that the other person wore and I want the exact same dress. And how do we take those images and enable the searching through those images? So we're taking and breaking those traditional approaches of searching, and then we're trying to bring those together in the problem solving. So if you think about the traditional approach, we threw the product problem, the tech problem, the business problem, we used our tools and we got a solution. But what machine learning and AI offers back to us is not only that traditional approach, but also the models that allow us to solve problems beyond what we ask for. So as a retailer or as a customer, we never asked for, could you cross sell me something else that I wasn't even knowing that I was looking for, right? So I was there, I was shopping for it and you gave me the bag and you told me I could, you could, I could buy something else that would then help me and then complete my purchase and my look for that night. Are you helping our businesses that think about how can I optimize this pricing? How can I make it easier for our customers to get a better value product? How do I fulfill these items in a much more efficient way? So I have a store that has the dress. I have another store that has the purse. How can I ensure that our customers can get that perfect look where they want it, when they want it, and how can I solve those fulfillment needs? So what machine learning and AI provided to us was not just solutions to the problem that we threw at it, but learnings from that data that allowed us to then improve for problems that we didn't even ask or knew that we were trying to solve, right? And so that's the progression that we're taking in that journey. 
And I think no progression in a journey comes without a set of challenges. So if you are a part of an organization where you've gone through that maturity of coming to the point where you are using data science to solve many of the problems, I'm sure you often get asked a bunch of questions. And I sure do. Um, I've put some you know, common ones that I often get asked in this work is, Artificial intelligence is going to take over humans. So is this going to take over all of us and replace us with these machines? And my view on that is we're offloading the grunt work to these machines, right? So data crunching in large numbers that you we would have to be reliant on at the time that we were building these solutions in terms of analysis. Can we offload the grunt work of stocking our shelves where you, we could use robotics and make that more efficient and then use the time of ourselves and our customers and our associates where they can bring the greatest value, right? Uh, the next question that I often get asked as a challenge is these models are biased. They're biased against gender. They could be biased against mindsets. And um, what I often remind myself and others is models and machines are not biased. What's really biased is the mindset or the human mind. And when we have the right mindset, the right culture to solve these problems in an unbiased manner, that's when we're going to solve these uh, in the true manner. So how do we remove that bias from the data? And that's where we need the human intervention. We want to make sure that we consciously are removing biases as we continue to train these systems just problem solve for the problems at hand. And then last but not the least, how do you know these models are truly learning? Are they learning? Are they evolving? Uh, are they taking feedback? Are they improving? Are they going to continue to make predictions that are accurate? And we can't do that without the human support, right? So we need the human intervention to look at that data, look at the prediction, understand the change in environment, understand the change in behaviors, and then train these models to make better, bigger, and much more efficient predictions. So what I'm gonna share with you this, um, you know, today is hope you've had as much fun and learn and at least nodded your head a few times as you related to these. So my ride comes to an end now, but hope you've had a good time. So unfasten your seatbelts, gear up to take your next ride through your own journey and then go off and create new stories and awesome products. Thank you.